with the youth, irregardless of any ignorance that they may temporarily have. The ignorance can be blotted out with learning and education. But the one thing that they have going for them that we do not have is courage. Finish preaching, Doc. Nick's all right. I, uh, now, there are a, a lot of, uh, I, I, you know, one of the privileges you have when you're up front, you get to, to read the audience as a matter of countenance. And, and that statement, which is a provocative statement, of course, um, registered with a lot of people. There were people on the panel who stood up when he said that the, uh, the youth understand that, that the adults are scared of white people. And there's some folks who stood up like, like they still young. But, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, Dr. Dr. Johnson, when you say when you say adults, can you just give us just a kind of intellectual line that you draw that separates youth from adult? I think that generally speaking, somewhere around the age of 25, I would argue as a psychologist where that transition is made. However, I would say that one ceases to be a youth and begins to be an adult, politically speaking, within the context of the subject. You cease to be a youth and you begin to be an adult once you begin to identify with the system of oppression and once you begin to exercise fears, anxieties, and reservations about dealing with the white man. Part of the definition of being a youth is willing to take risks. And I think that one of the biggest issues we've had in our community with leadership is we have a very poor system <clears throat> of intergenerational transfer of leadership. Mm. Right. Yeah. We had this conversation down at ASCAP oh, wow. this past weekend mm -hmm. in Norfolk, Virginia, and we're the only culture I see, the only community where we still elect presidents of organizations well into their 70s and 80s. Amen. We do this in the church, we do it in the integrationist organizations, we do it in the nationalist organizations. Mm -hmm. And not only are many of the leaders of elder age, they're not even training their replacements. You know? And we're the only ones who do that. And that's one of the reasons why I have so much profound respect for the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, because he's the only leader, major leader since slavery, who actually took up the task of training the replacement. And so we have a situation where the youth often feel that they have to push the elders out the way yes. because they see that they've lost their effectiveness. And let me say this briefly. The reason why elders have trouble giving up leadership, I understand it. It's related to the psychological castration of the black male ego. Because we're not allowed to be men in society. We're not allowed to compete the way the white man can't compete. In those few spheres of life where we are allowed to be men, the church, the organization, and the home. All right. When we taste a little bit of what it is like <laughs> to be a man with power, we take it to excess, we abuse it. I don't think we'll ever rectify this problem, and I think it's going to take elders to check uh, the elders. Yeah. Right. It's not the youth. It's the elders who have to say, listen, You've been running this church for 50 years, but the gallows are empty now. That young brother, you've got to give him an opportunity because if not, you're going to lose the whole church. So we have to look at how the youth, it's because the elders are scared of the youth, but they fail to recognize that the elders still have a role. Though. You don't throw them away. You need the elders for counsel and the youth for war. You need them for structure. <laughs> And until we do that, it's going to be hard to reattract it out <laughs> to many of our organizations when they see somebody old enough to be their great grandfather as the president. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, how many of you have enjoyed what we've shared thus far? We are really pleased to have all of our, our panelists with us.